This morning, the potter and the unwieldy clay. Now, I invite you to open your Bibles to those two chapters from which we read in Jeremiah 18 and 19. We have in 18 and 19 the before and after pictures. The context of chapters 18 and 19 are held together by this common imagery of the potter and pottery. It really doesn't take much in the way of explaining this image because all of us in some way or another have been potters, whether it be making mud pies in your backyard as a youngster or in appreciating the lovely enameled vases other objects that, well, adorn our lives. And what we have here is an example of something that was very commonplace, as the prophets like to use common images. What we have is a reference to the kind of pottery wheels that were used in making this very common product of clay. The word that is used actually in our text in uh, what we find in verse 3, working at his wheel, that's what grammarians call a dual form, two wheels. That's a depiction of antiquity, how the process of making such a clay vessel occurred. There was an upper wheel on which you had the clay, and then the lower wheel, which was heavier, the two were connected by an axle. And the potter could turn the hole with his foot at the lower wheel. The dual form of wheels. This imagery will lead me to think about three things for us to consider drawn from these two passages. And then before we leave, the application of what this might mean for us today. First, God as potter. That's what we find in the emphasis here in verses 1 through 4. Do you notice how often the word potter occurs in these verses? Potter's house, potter's house. Goes on to speak of the potter's hand. And then in verse 4, as it seemed good to the potter to do. You'll see it again in verse 6, the potter. Same word occurring, translated differently. You'll find this in verse 11, I am shaping. That's the word, I am molding disaster. And this word causes me to reflect on how it's used elsewhere. What we find is that the potter, of course God, is the great creator. It's the same word that occurs where you have a context of God who is creating. And I suppose the best known example would be found from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where there we read, the Lord God formed, that's our word, the man, and he breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living being. You're familiar with that imagery of a potter over his clay as he is personally involved in creating the first human. Closer to home for Jeremiah is chapter 1 where he describes himself before, that is God speaking, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So, you can see that we have a mixture of the potter and the birth process, the womb. In Isaiah 44, we learn that God is also the creator of the nation, where he says, Thus says the Lord who made and formed you in the womb. God is the potter. He's the creator of the nation Israel, but also every individual that made up that people. 
God is not only the great creator, but also he is a zealous creator. I derive that from verse 6, where it says there that he will do as he pleases with the pottery. And in particular, in verse 4, he will do what seems good to him by reworking that unwieldy clay. Now, you have in mind, of course, that old mud pie from yesteryear or that clay or silly putty. What happens when you leave that out? Remember when mom and dad said, make sure you put it back in the canister? And of course, we didn't do it. So what would happen? It would dry out, become brittle and unwieldy. I'm reminded of how sometimes we, around the house, want to mix up that cement. We add the water, we mix it up, and then we apply it. But since we're not experts, most of us, yeah, you'd be wise to add a little water at a time to get to that right consistency. And if you don't, it'd be unwieldy, lumpy, useless. Here we have a zealous creator who's going to take that unwieldy clay and he's going to transform it into another vessel. This is spoiled clay, representative of the disobedient people. I was reminded of uh, a young man by the name of Mark who was at Harvard University and with his parents' approval, he moved all the way from the East Coast to Silicon Valley in California. He and a couple of friends bought a small house, rented it 30 miles south of San Francisco. Mark had an idea, and he wanted to see if he could pull it off. He had an idea for a new software application. So his first investment was from a, a local person of a half a million dollars. So the Mark and his friends got started. And they launched their application in 2004. It was named Facebook. After one year, he was approached by a, a well-known software company, offered him $1 billion. He said, no, thank you. After two years, he was approached by an even better known software company. They offered him $14 billion. He personally would have netted $4 billion. Now, I don't know where you would be in that process. I'm rather confident I would have accepted the $1 billion. It would have taken me all weekend to spend that. <laughs> and I've, I've, I've thought, how could you walk away from 14 billion, personally $4 billion? It was because Facebook was his baby. It was his creation. And he was zealous for it. He had not seen it fulfilled yet. Any parent knows what it's like to be zealous. But all of us, in one way or another, a project, a goal, we don't want to let go of it. God had created the people of Israel. They were unwieldy, but he wasn't finished with them yet. The potter is the great creator. The potter is also a zealous creator. He will not abandon his people. And that leads us then to really the emphasis of this passage. Elsewhere, when we have the potter and pottery imagery and the prophets, and then what we read earlier in Romans 9, there's always an emphasis on the potter. But this passage is unlike those. Here, there's an emphasis on on the pottery, Israel, verses 5 through 12, focus on the people. In verse 6, it just simply tells us that the people are subject to the great creator. The pottery is subject to the potter. 
Now, they want to deny that, but it's an undeniable factor. When we move on to what we find in verses 7 through 10, we find that the pottery, well, the pottery has a choice. Now, this is where the imagery breaks down. Have you ever had a child who has proudly displayed to you something that's been drawn or colored, and you say to yourself, I'm not really sure what that is. So you're going to have to move there gently and kindly, and you might say something like this, oh, that's a beautiful horse. And the child says, that's not a horse, that's a dog. <laughs> now, we might be unsure, but the person who is making the vessel is definitive. <laughs> and what we find is that where it breaks down is you don't have pottery jump up to the potter and say, I think I'll be a horse or I think I'll be a dog. And the potter doesn't turn to the potter and say, your choice. Would you like to be a horse or would you like to be a dog today? That doesn't happen. But in this case, the people, the pottery, they have to make a choice. Now, it's interesting how these verses fit together because they show a parallel, a parallel language, same language, but the parallel is contrasting. Look at it with me. It says in verse 7, if at any time, and then in verse 9, and if at any time. Go back up to 8. I will relent of the disaster. And then verse 10, I will relent of the good. So there's a contrast in this choice. The opening two verses give an opportunity to pursue what is right, what is productive, what is effective. Whereas what follows is for those who want to continue in their wickedness. So a choice is given to the people. Now, what we find is in this verse 11, a summons to make a decision because they face this choice. And it says in verse 11, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. That's a fascinating word, plan, because we'll see it again in their response in verse 12. We want to go with our own plans. But I think more importantly, we've seen this word in Jeremiah. It'll come again in chapter um, 29, where there it says, I know the plans I have for you, and it's a good plan. It's not for wickedness, but a good plan. So here we face what is a rather peculiar, isn't it? On the one hand, we have told that the Lord God is the great sovereign over Israel. And he has a plan, a plan of blessing. But yet at the same time, he gives the people an opportunity to make a choice. And the people choose to go their own way. And that leads me then to talk about how these are a stiff-necked people. In chapter 19, it describes in verse 15, they have stiffened their neck, refusing to hear my words. How is it that God can make of them a reworked vessel? The prophets are always given to show and tell. And earlier speaks of a loincloth or cloth and how this loincloth is soiled, but it can be refurbished. And there we have a similar idea. In chapter 13, this new loincloth is for God's glory, that the people might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. 
How is it that God can transform these people into that which bears his name, that which is for his glory, whether it be the loincloth or the pottery? I said there were three things. This is the third. The potter must make a new vessel. And how is he going to do that? In order to make that unwieldy clay, that dry clay, useful, he has to add water and refurbish it and rework it. And the way in which he will accomplish this, as I mentioned earlier, chapter 29, is by giving the people a new heart. See, in our passage right here, it says, it was out of the stubbornness of his evil heart. They need to have a new heart. Chapter uh, 29, there he says, I know the plans I have for you. And then he goes on to say, you will seek and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He's going to give them a new heart. And we know in the New Covenant, chapter 31, of Jeremiah quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 there Jeremiah says I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts he's going to make of these people a heart that will love the Lord that is no longer a stiff neck people but a redeemed people a reconstituted people a transformed people I'd like for us to consider three things we can take from this passage that we've been speaking of. The first is this. We are creatures. Sometimes we push back against that because of our culture. As you know, our culture wants to, in many ways, diminish the value of human life. It seems like we're just one step away from the animal world. But we've got to remember also that we're just not the supreme creation, but we are creatures. And when we come to recognize that we are creatures, just like Israel should have recognized it, they were a creation of God. It really does put an end to our pride. It really should put an end in silence the notion of making our own plans at the expense of God's plan. So we have to ask ourselves this morning, are we building our kingdom or God's kingdom? Are we interested in our agendas or God's agenda? God as the potter and we as the clay will remem uh, remind us that we are just creatures second thing I'd like to take from this is in terms of our own ministry. F.B. Meyer said this of chapter 18, a memorial to patience. That's what it's like when you think of a potter and his clay. Patient. I could never be a potter. I don't have that kind of patience. But a potter who loves his creation will mold that creation to conform to his imagination. And I would like for us to take from this about our ministries. See, God is working with us as a potter does his clay, and he's patient. Are we patient? Are we submissive? Now, the faculty may be through with you after three or four or five years, you'll leave this place. We're done. But God's not done. There's more to come. And he will transform us personally, but also he will transform our ministry. Sometimes we think that God abandons us to the gifts that we have now. What are the prospects of developing our gifts what are the processes of God equipping us with new gifts to meet new challenges? We are at times demoralized by our failures, 
our disappointments. But that's all part of adding water to the clay. God is working with us, and he will make of us wonderful plans. He will make of us a vessel that is a testimony to his name, to his glory. And then the third thing I'd like for us to take from this is a grateful heart. In Romans chapter 9, as you know, the people were recalcitrant. They were arguing with the Apostle Paul. They didn't like the way this was working out for the Gentiles. And of course, Paul addresses that sometimes not as kindly as other times. But one thing that we often overlook, I think, in Romans chapter 9, when we think of the potter and the pottery, is in the previous verses, such as verse 16 of chapter 9, there there's an emphasis on God's mercy. God calls upon us to submit to whatever that plan is for us individually. But let us always know that it is a plan of mercy and goodness. And sh what should be our response? A grateful heart. God has transformed our heart. God is making us into an obedient people. Now we must have a grateful heart. Francis Havergal wrote uh, the hymn that we are about to sing in the 19th century. She was an English poet and hymn writer. You know her work from other hymns, like a river glorious. Who is on the Lord's side? She published volumes of poetry and hymns. But her best known we're about to sing. Take my life and let it be. I think Israel in the before picture, they would have said, yes, take my life and let it be in the sense of leave me alone. But that's not what she wrote, is it? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And then toward the end of the hymn, Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne.